um, continue with your presentation. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thanks for inviting me here. Let me see if this is working. Okay. Are you seeing a full page slide? Yes. Here? Yes. Excellent. Glad that worked. Um, this is all really interesting. I've learned a lot today, so I'm glad to have gotten introduced to this group. Thank you. Um, and I think that this presentation will tie in well with some of the things that were just um, discussed uh, in the last presentation. And I was at a, uh, I've been to a few different beaver conferences recently, and I heard one person say, you know, in terms of water, no matter what the problem is, the answer is beavers. You might not know it yet, but at some way or another, the answer is beavers. Um, and I've been learning, this wasn't, you know, what I expected to do as part of my career, but they kept showing up uh, over and over again in our city in various ways, in the streams and the stormwater infrastructure. And it became, um, you know, someone had to take on beavers as sort of their main thing because they're, they, you know, after humans, they're the species in the world who change their environment the most, for the most part, right? And so um, they have huge impacts on the land and on the water in their area, and that can have amazing benefits. It can also have a lot of conflicts where humans are also trying to do different things with the water. Um, and something else that I heard at a conference recently was um, in the journals of some of the European settlers as they were moving across the West about 200 years ago, um, was that, and actually a little bit before that, before a lot of the trapping happened, maybe 250 years ago, um, in their journals, they had described that the entire landscape was dominated by the activities of two species. And those were humans, the indigenous people that were living here, and beavers. And they said that the land above the waterline was entirely managed and shaped by the humans that were living here, mostly through fire and other ways of driving herds around. And that the water, all the streams, rivers, lakes, ponds, wetlands, were entirely managed um, by the beavers that were living there and all the things that they did. Um, and of course, somewhere between about 250 and 150 years ago, all of, almost all of the beavers that were living this landscape and shaping the entire water of the entire United States uh, were pretty much extirpated. They were pretty much trapped out. Um, and um, through lots of different policies and, you know, not just people going out and trapping, but actual policies of let's go try to remove all the beavers to basically destroy the landscape uh, before other people came through so that certain countries could claim it over other countries. Um, and that drastically changed um, pretty much the entire landscape of the United States. And um, What's unfortunate about a lot of our perceptions now about what these landscapes are supposed to look like is that they were shaped as the European settlers moved west and saw these landscapes without the beavers there, right? So it had been one way for tens of thousands of years, um, and now it looked really different um, for, for just a few decades between the removal of fire because of all the damage that was done to the native human populations and the removers, removal of the beavers. Um, so often if you were to ask someone, I can even ask all of you here, try to envision in your mind what a pristine, untouched stream looks like. And I think most of us will think of a cool, flowing, cascading stream, you know, probably one channel, you know, moving um, through a landscape. Um, and in reality, when beavers dominated most of the landscape, that was fairly rare. The beavers would dam that up and it would be a slower moving network of channels and wetlands and pools and riffles. Um, and so even just our thoughts of, of what's ideal for, for restoration or for pristine uh, is shaped by that bias of seeing it right after these animals were, were removed. So I'm gonna be talking about um, as they're coming back into our area, what we're seeing um, and some of the things that that we've learned. And I'll be talking a lot about the urban area because that's where I work, but a lot of these same things apply no matter where you are. You might have fewer conflicts or different conflicts outside of the urban area. Um, so overall, I'm gonna be talking about Beavers in Gresham, which is the city in which I work. That's uh, right next to Portland, Oregon. Um, we're a suburb of Portland. And this is a map of Gresham here. And so it's a it's a medium sized city. You can see there's you know some dense urbanization, um, but something that's really important is that we still have a lot of streams. Um, in many of the cities uh, throughout the country, the streams as the city was built, the streams are sort of put underground into pipes, and then um, they can't act as habitat. They can't possibly create you know beaver wetlands. Uh, but Gresham still has a lot of streams, so there's actually a lot of possibility for restoration and habitat here. 
Um, and I'm going to talk about three studies that I've conducted in the last few years, looking at how the beavers have impacted the streams here um, through stormwater runoff, um, stream temperatures, and stream complexity. And then I'm going to talk a bit about the conflicts that that's, uh, that's the beavers are, are creating, in addition to all their benefits, and some things that we've been doing for coexistence, which has been really important. Um, so here's an overview of beavers in Gresham. So this is one of our main streams here. It's called Johnson Creek. It's a salmon bearing stream. It has three different species of um, Endangered Species Act listed salmon spawning it. We have coho, steelhead, and chinook all spawning in Johnson Creek, which runs right through downtown Portland, downtown Gresham, um, and yet it's still a salmon bearing stream, which is really exciting. Um, and as we were surveying um, this section for beavers, Here's a section that goes right through downtown Gresham, and all of these dots are beaver dams. So we're finding dozens of beaver dams, um, and this is just a three-mile stretch here. And the first year of the survey, about 20 years ago, we found two, and then it's been increasing in this last one that was just done a couple months ago. Uh, there were over 100, so they're definitely increasing um, in the city in the last few years. And there, there's sort of a, a regional increase and an increase throughout the country as trapping has lessened, um, killing has lessened, restoration has taken place, um, and people have sort of gained an awareness of the importance of a lot of the beavers will come back on their own if they if they aren't killed and if they have some stuff to eat and if they're allowed to you know sort of flood their local area. Um, and one thing to notice on here, all of these green parcels are the publicly owned properties. So as you go up the stream, there tend to be a lot of dams on the publicly owned properties and then pretty much none on the privately owned parcels. Um, and we're finding that uh, throughout the area. And that's probably twofold. Um, one is, well, threefold. One is that uh, beavers don't tend to like a lot of, you know, hubbub coming from people. So if it's, you know, right next to somewhere where there's a lot of people coming and going or, or you know, equipment or something, they're less likely to be there. Um, it's partially because our public areas we've been restoring with riparian restoration planting. So there's more food for the beavers and more um, trees for them to build on. Um, and then also because on private land uh, in Oregon, people are still allowed to trap beavers, to kill them, to remove the dams. And so some of it is just, they're actually trying to build in some of these reaches and they just get removed from there. Whereas on public land, uh, we generally leave them where they are. Um, and yeah, I'll talk a lot more about the benefits and the conflicts. Um, one thing that I wanted to mention though that I thought was really interesting, just a couple of weeks ago, I was talking to a woman who lives on this creek right here who called because she said, oh my gosh, my stream is completely ruined. Can someone from the city come out and tell me what's going on and help me? And I came out there and a beaver had built a dam on the stream that went through her backyard. And um, she's like, this is terrible. You know, these pests have come in and ruined my stream. And we, we had all these assumptions about, okay, some people, landowners, homeowners don't like beavers, environmentalists like beavers, and here's some sort of conflict. Um, but after we talked to her for a while, she simply didn't know that beavers could be good for stream health. In her mind, the stream was supposed to be a cool, free-flowing stream, and she didn't realize beavers were native. She didn't realize they were important to the ecosystem. And so she thought that they had really just ruined something and turned it into this gross, smelly, disgusting bog, right? Um, and when we simply explained that, oh no, this is part of the natural ecosystem, uh, the salmon actually really like it, it's it, the juvenile coho will, will rear in the beaver pond. She's like, oh wait, this is a good thing? And we said, yeah, and she said, oh, well that's fine, then leave the pond, that's great. Um, so some of this is just about education and perspective and assumptions about what's good or bad. Um, and here's some examples of what some of the beavers in Gresham look like. So this is sort of a typical dam that we'll see on Johnson Creek. It's not huge, just sort of creates a pond behind it. Here's another one. This is right um, near our main park in the middle of downtown. So people can come and see this one, which is exciting. Um, they get into our stormwater infrastructure. I'll show us some more pictures of this later, but you know, it's a city. We have pipes, we have manholes, we have all sorts of things. Um, and one thing that I wanted to share, we had one resident who had a dam on her property um, and she was actually really excited about it. She's retired, she's a wildlife photographer and she we gave her a trail camera and um, then she took a bunch of her own photos and videos and she gave them all to me and I compiled them into a little four minute video here that I wanted to share because I'm gonna be showing a lot of data graphs but I wanna first show you um, how cool 
the beavers are and all the different types of habitat for other animals that they can create. So this is going to be a little four minute compilation of videos. And this is all just from one dam right in the middle of Gresham. It's like a mile from downtown and all of the, the beavers and the animals that are using this dam and its habitat. Right. So that's a video that we use for outreach and education. And we give talks at the library about all this wildlife. And pretty much every single animal that you saw in that video has increased in abundance since the beavers have been returning to Gresham because those dams provide a variety of habitats. They provide, you know, they can walk across the dam. They can use the pond behind the dam. They help clean the water. So we'll talk more about all of that. 
Uh, so the first study I wanted to talk about is um, in a large constructed wetland. And my main job for the city is to study stormwater runoff and the pollution in that water and ways that we can clean it. And um, that's sort of how I first came about the, the beavers in Gresham. So this case study here is in a large constructed wetland, which if you're not familiar with those, um, this is a place where basically um, some engineers designed a facility where the dirty runoff that comes off of all the roads can help be cleaned by the wetland before it goes to um, the local stream. Um, and uh, this particular wetland here, it's about 13 acres and it drains about a thousand acres of largely industrial land. You can see all these big roofs here and they all drain um, into this wetland um, and get cleaned before it discharges. And before this wetland was built about 15 years ago, um, that water just discharged directly and uh, created a lot of pollution in the stream and now it helps to clean it. Um, and this wet, the, when the engineers designed this, it's all very carefully calculated and designed for the water to take a very specific path and have a very specific residence time and, you know, ponding depth and all these things. Um, and after I'd been in place for a few years, we were noticing that it really wasn't behaving the way it was expected to behave. Um, and upon investigation, it was because a family of beavers had moved in um, and created these dams, which then created ponds behind them and really changed everything about the wetland. Um, and of course, we shouldn't have been surprised. We created um, a wetland planted with uh, a couple thousand willows, which beavers love. And there were all these beautiful little constrictions here where the water would flow down this little terrace to the next level. Um, and it creates the sound of running water, which beavers just have to dam up. Um, and so, of course, they did this. Um, and these were the by far the most controversial meetings I've ever been in in my career where um, at the city everyone had a very strong opinion and um, and it was really hard to find any common ground where some people were like this is amazing beavers are the answer to everything we should be so excited this is happening and, um, and on the other side you know these varmints are coming in and ruining our multi-million dollar project and uh, we have no idea how to maintain it and this is terrible and let's kill them. Um, and lots and lots of um, discussions happened and we hadn't gotten very far. And it was finally decided that we could have a few more years to study the water quality impacts at this facility because the whole purpose of the facility is to help clean this runoff, right? And so we wanted to objectively answer the question, do the beavers dams help clean the runoff or do they hinder it? And if they hinder it, we'll try to figure out a way to exclude beavers. Um, if they help it, then we'll try to figure out a way to coexist with the beavers. Um, and so we conducted a study collecting water quality samples um, during storms. So when it's raining really hard and all that pollution is washing off of the roads into the facility, um, we take samples at the inlet and the outlet um, and compare how well the facility is cleaning the water. And we're able to do seven storms without the dams and six storms with the dams in place and compare those. Uh, we looked at 27 different stormwater pollutants, especially heavy metals, nutrients, sediment, and a variety of pesticides. Um, and one thing of note is that during the middle of this, we did actually go out and remove the dams um, so that we could take some more samples. We had some already from before the dams were built and then some samples when they were there, we removed the dams, took some more samples without them. And then the dams, of course, they came and built them back and took some more samples with them. Um, and so we were able to compare that. And just of a note, when I was actually out there removing these dams by hand and they were full of wildlife themselves, uh, it was the middle of the hot, dry summer and we'd find frogs and salamanders hanging out within the matrix of the dam and snakes basking on the tops of them. So that was just really cool to see. And also just to point out that the matrix of this dam, it's, you know, it's not solid, it's not concrete, it's this um, mixture of soil and twigs and leaves, um, and water really moves through it, which will be important to talk about later. Uh, so here's a summary of the results, where here we're looking at the percent pollutant removal. So if the number is right at zero, that means that it didn't do anything, right? That's the same water coming in as out. What we'd love to see is numbers getting close towards 100 here, where it's removing a lot of pollution, right? Um, and these are all the storms when the dams were absent. And so here we're looking at a few different heavy metals, some uh, nutrients, sediment, and pesticides. Um, and probably what you'll notice from this is just it wasn't doing a particularly good job. It wasn't doing a great job when the when the 
dams weren't present. Um, and that's partially because some of the vegetation never really grew in because the groundwater levels were different than expected. But for various reasons, it wasn't doing a great job. We don't expect numbers up at 100 for lots of reasons, especially because this was a, a retrofit where we just fit what we could into a spot. It would have been much bigger had we designed this for a new development. But the big question is, would it, is it doing better or worse when the dams are present? So let's see. So here's when the dams are present. Um, and uh, you can see for every single pollutant we looked at, uh, more pollution is being removed when those dams are present than when they're absent. So it was a pretty clear um, answer that yes, these dams are good for water quality. And so therefore we need to figure out how to coexist with the beavers here. Um, and just to think about the mechanism, how does that work? How are they good for water quality? If you think about the beaver dam itself, this is one of the dams in the facility when there's a big storm coming through. Um, you see most of the water is not going over the dam, right? It's actually flowing through the dam, getting in contact with that soil, with those twigs, with all the microbes in the soil. So it's physically filtering the water. Um, there's uh, chemical transformations of products. There's biological transformation of the pollutants um, through the microbes. Um, and you know, in, in stormwater science, we've known for a really long time that passing dirty stormwater through soil works really well, cleans a lot of pollution. That's why we have things like rain gardens and stormwater planters and, and things like that. The reason we don't usually design huge constructed wetlands that take a thousand acres of runoff to actually move through soil is because there's so much water and so much force that if when you try to do that at a really large scale, you're just going to get blowouts, right? Every time a storm comes through, it would breach your soil wall and you'd have to be doing a lot of maintenance. You need a whole maintenance crew dedicated to going out after every storm and patching up all those holes, right? And we just don't have the capacity for that at the city. Do you know who does? The beavers, right? They're literally a dedicated maintenance crew that goes out after every storm and uh, patches up each and every little breach. If even just an inch falls out of one section, they're there the next night patching it up, right? So they make this perfect little uh, soil berm that all the water can filter through. So they're basically this amazing self-sustaining free labor, you know, way to clean the storm water really well. Um, and just to understand, if you're not very fami familiar with green stormwater infrastructure, this is how some of the ways that the pollutants are um, captured in a constructed wetland with beaver dams. So the nutrients are often taken up by plants and or change form to be less toxic when they get to the stream. Um, the sediment is physically it's settled out in filters. Beavers are great for settling out sediment, right? They actually aggrade streams as they go. Um, the heavy metals tend to bind to, to um, the sediment and the matrix as they go through it and get filtered out. Um, pesticides also bind. Many of those pesticides actually change form through the microbes into something that is less toxic. And so here are just some notes when I give this presentation to engineers or to cities who are building their own facilities. Um, some things that we've learned to keep in mind when when either you do or you don't want beavers to show up for your facility, uh, to your facility. And the first thing we learned is just to consider them in the first place, understand that beavers might show up and is it gonna be a disaster if they show up? And if it is, then you should maybe change your design. Um, if you don't want them, try to minimize constrictions with the sound of running water. So this right here, for example, is um, in that same facility. This was our sediment four bay here that's supposed to allow sediment to drop out. And there's this very heavily engineered orifice structure here that was this lovely little slot um, that created this beautiful loud sound of flowing water. And so what do the beavers do? They come and just clog that up with the mud and grass here uh, every night and our maintenance crew and then this is flooding our access road and the sediment's not dropping out properly um, and it's going into the overflow structure and so our maintenance crew would come out here every week and move the stuff off of here right and the beavers would come and build it back the next day so this is uh, not very helpful for this so I'll talk more about that later um, and then of course avoid planting beaver food if you don't want them there. If you don't want beavers, don't plant uh, a thousand willow trees. That was a bad choice if we didn't want them to show up. Uh, if you do want them to show up, which increasingly more people are wanting after seeing success of things like this, um, most importantly, you need to allow extra space for ponding, which can be really hard. A lot of these facilities are built by developers as a requirement when they go in, and it's hard for us to require something that's above and beyond the minimum detention standards, right? And so if we're able to design our own facility, then we'd love to make it bigger so that the beavers can pond it, but that's difficult with the current regulations uh, for the private side. Um, 
plant beaver food, willows, alders, cottonwoods. Um, and then most importantly, be open to change. Every time we thought we got a handle on something at this facility, you go out there the next time and it's totally different. They've built a dam in a different place. They've felled these trees. They've you know done something here or there. Um, and one theme that I've learned is that humans in general, and especially like maintenance operation crews in particular, um, really like to be in control. They, they like to be the ones that are, you know, they know what's going to happen. They've got it under control and they know exactly where the water is going to go. And it's, it's almost just sort of a mind shift to being able to give up some of that control and allow it to be different every time and, and see what's going to work. Okay, so moving on to the second study, I'm going to talk for a few minutes about heat as a pollutant. So uh, in, or in our Oregon streams, actually, heat is our number one pollutant that's regulated for, and that tends to cause the most death of salmon, well, other than a tire chemical called 6-PPD quinone, which if people want to ask about that in the questions, I'm happy to talk about it. Um, but heat actually is one of our number one. The streams are generally too hot for a lot of our cold water fish um, due to deforestation, destruction of the riparian area, loss of the beavers who help can help to cool the stream um, and other um, and other reasons. Uh, building uh, ponds in the stream for irrigation can also really heat them up. Um, and so this is an example of in 2015, we had a really hot June and these were some Chinook salmon that turned into Johnson Creek to try to find some cold water and it was way too hot for them and there was a mass die off event of these Chinook right before they could spawn. Um, and so one question that we were getting is at the same time that we were working with a lot of um, landowners, farmers to try to get rid of their um, their ponds that were used for irrigation or aesthetics. Um, at the same time, we were encouraging beavers um, and we didn't have a lot of data on it. And rightly so, a lot of the farmers and landowners were saying, uh, what's the deal here? You're saying that you don't like my pond, but you like their pond. Um, how does that make any sense? And we said, that's a really good point. Let's do a specific study looking at uh, how the human ponds and the beaver ponds warm the streams and, and what the differences are. And so for this particular study, we looked at 14 human dams and associated ponds and eight beaver dams and associated ponds. Um, the reason there are more beaver dams on here, I told you we had 100, is because for this study, we wanted dams that were sort of big enough to make a substantial pond, so at least two feet high. And then we needed to be able to take a temperature point upstream of the influence of the of the pond and downstream of the influence of the pond to see what the pond is doing to the stream. And in that intermediate area, we needed to have no other um, huge influences on temperature. So there couldn't be another stream coming in or a stormwater pipe or something else. And so, and there couldn't be just another beaver pond right upstream of it because then we can't get that point. And so that was sort of the limitation. We, we found eight that, that would meet all of those criteria. And uh, just a summary of what we found here, here we're looking at the change in maximum stream temperature downstream of the dam. So we're looking at that point upstream of the dam to downstream, and then how much did that stream change as it went through that pond? So we're not looking at the temperature in the pond, just upstream and downstream of it. And um, the average there is a lot of variation in all the in all the ponds. Um, and in the human ponds, the average is about two or three degrees Celsius, which can be pretty substantial. Um, the streams in Gresham tend to be above the summer temperature standard for already about two months of the year in the summer. And with this extra two or three degrees Celsius, suddenly now they're above it for about four months of the summer. And so if you're a, a fish trying to find a place to hide out for a while, four months is a lot harder to avoid than two months. Um, whereas the beaver ponds, look at this, on average, they slightly cooled the stream, right? In terms of, uh, of the, uh, the, maximum temperature upstream and downstream of it. And I'll talk a little bit about why that might be. And then in terms of regulation, this is the number that we're most concerned with. I sort of mentioned it a second ago, but this is the added temperature exceedances downstream of the dam. So if the um, if the stream is already exceeding for let's say two months of the year, how many additional days is it exceeding by the time it goes through this pond? And you can see on average here, it's an extra 50 days. So almost two months if it's going through a human pond on average, it's a lot of variation. Look at this, pretty tightly around zero here. The the beaver dams didn't tend to add many, if any, exceedances to, to that. And again, the key to this is because of the porous structure of the dam itself. So 
with most of the hu human dams, it's made out of concrete or some other impervious surf structure. And the water, as it heats up, it stratifies. We found that in any pond, beaver or human, that was at least two feet deep, we got substantially colder water at the bottom than we did at the top, right? And so you have this hot water at the top. And if you have a concrete dam, that hottest water is skimming right off the top and being sent downstream, right? So all summer, you're taking the hottest of the hot water and sending that on. So no wonder it's warming up. Whereas the beaver dam, with its porous matrix of uh, mud and sticks and grass, as that water comes, there's usually no water flowing over the dam at all in the summer. It's all flowing through the dam. So you're getting some of that hot water from the top, some medium water from the bottom, and some cold or from the middle, and some cold water from the bottom. And all of that's going downstream and mixing. Um, and in some of these areas, the reason it might actually help cool it is that by ponding up the water into that wetland, you start to enhance a uh, hyperreic flow and exchange with the groundwater, and you can actually get some cool water that's sent downstream. And I'll just note here too that just having this pond here, um, whether it's a human pond or a beaver pond, having that differentiation in temperature instead of just having one stream, by having a pond that has some warmer water, some medium water, and some cooler water, um, a lot of fish or other aquatic wildlife that um, needs a specific temperature, it can find that, right? If you're something that needs warmer, you can get up higher. If you're something that needs cold, you can go and find something colder. So just having the pond there gives some variation of habitat. And if you walk this stretch section of stream, you'll see all the little fish hanging out in these beaver ponds down in the bottom, right, in the hot summer. Um, and so just to point out some of the factors that were contributing to how these ponds were warming the water, this is all of the individual ponds that we looked at in the study, um, and they're just stacked here on the left of the ponds that um, cooled the stream the most, the ones that didn't change the temperature, and then the ponds that warmed the stream the most. Um, and I have them color-coded here where the beaver ponds are in green, right? So although there is... Um, an average right around zero here, we have some that warmed it a lot, right? So you can't bl blanketly say out there beaver dams cool streams or beaver dams don't warm streams. That's not true. Many beaver dams do warm streams, and we'll talk about some of those um, factors. Um, of note, this blue pond here was a human pond that cooled it quite a bit, and it had a subsurface outlet. So instead of the hot water sipping off the top of the pond, it had a, a structure where it's taking some of that cold water from the bottom and sending that downstream. So no wonder um, that's cooler. So um, that's something to consider for dams if temperature is the, the major problem. So what were some of the factors that were correlated with um, whether a, a dam warmed or cooled uh, the stream? Um, a lot of it had to do with the upstream temperature. So if it was already a hot stream, it's harder to add more heat to it. Whereas if you had really cold water coming in, those tended to warm up more. How much shade is on it, of course. If you have a big flat open area um, with a lot of sun exposure, it's going to warm up more than something that's shaded. Surface area, if you have a big open uh, dam versus, you know, maybe a skinny narrow one. Uh, the depth of it, if it's deep enough to get a lot more of that cool water, it's going to not warm as much. Um, and then that connection to groundwater that I talked about. So I won't go into these too much, but just to show you in case there are any data nerds out there who want to think about it, um, here are all those ponds looking at the upstream temperature and then how much the pond, or yeah, how much the pond warmed the stream. So in these ponds where you had really cool, basically groundwater coming in, you're more likely to warm it more. Whereas these uh, sections of stream down here that were already hot, uh, you tended to not add very much um, and you, could even cool it. These were the beaver ponds down here. And of course, there's a confounding factor here where most of these beaver ponds were on these bigger, hotter streams than on the tiny little streams because there's not much room to dam there. Um, and similar surface area, of course, the, the more surface area you have on a pond tends to warm more than your ponds with little surface area. Um, and then uh, if you just look at the beaver in the subsurface versus a surface release, that's where you're seeing the really big difference here of, of how does that water get sent downstream? Is it over the top of concrete or is it through the dam itself? But overall, we're finding that there, there was good evidence, at least in Gresham, to show that if temperature is a major concern, um, that yes, we should still be concentrating on trying to remove or retrofit in some way those human ponds with a concrete dam that are sending water, the hot water downstream, and we should continue to encourage uh, the beaver dams because they can have a differentiating effect for the water and actually send some cool water downstream. All right, so the third study, the last study that I wanted to talk about, um, is 
stream complexity. So this is an example of what Johnson Creek looks like going through most of Gresham. Um, it has low complexity. It's one single channel. Um, it's got blackberries on the sides for the most part. It's not a lot, help, not a lot going on. And uh, when the beaver dam started to become more common over the last five to 10 years, uh, we were starting to see something different, which was really surprising and exciting. Um, this is actually, the, I took this picture, the landowner who took all the wildlife photos, who's really excited about the beaver, she called me one day and she's like, Katie, there's unembedded cobble in Johnson Creek. You'll never believe it. Come over. And I came over and these uh, this gravel bar here, we had never seen that in Johnson Creek. And all the years we've been working there, there's so much sediment that comes in from erosion from the farm fields that it's like it's like concrete on the bottom of the uh, pond where or stream where all of these cobbles would be sort of embedded in sediment. And right here is the beaver dam that was built on her property. And you can see that this cobble bar or this rock bar is being formed right downstream. So with the turbulence of the water flowing through and over that dam, it's cleaned out some of that sediment and created this new bar, which was really exciting. Um, here's another uh, dam on Johnson Creek and downstream of it, the cobble bar has been there long enough now. It had been there about four years at this point that grass was growing on it and the water is splitting to go around it. Uh, this year, actually, a single cottonwood just started growing here. It's about five feet tall. Um, here's some sediment-free gravel and cobble, which I had never seen in Johnson Creek before. So that was super exciting. Usually, this would just look like a brown mat with maybe some of the bigger rocks sticking up. And this was right downstream of the dam. Um, and who loves the sediment-free gravel and cobble? Well, the fish do. That's where they lay their eggs. Um, and the uh, macroinvertebrates that they eat, all the stoneflies and mayflies and caddisflies, live in that space. So as this habitat starts to come back with the beavers, um, as long as the water's clean enough, the, uh, the bugs will start to come back too. Um, and then this one's a little hard to see, but this is, uh, it's called Beaver Creek actually in Gresham, although there hadn't been beavers there for quite a long time, but obviously there used to be when it was named, uh, was always a single channel. And then a dam was built right here. It's down in a canyon. That's why I'm seeing it from above. And the water started to go through this side channel over here and come through. Um, and there was a dam here. And so, and you can see the water's kind of coming around that dam. And so, and this dam was only two years old when this started to happen, right? And so for an ecologist, this is really exciting. Instead of having this simple, uh, single threaded channel, suddenly we're starting to get a side channel and a multi-threaded channel. Um, if you're this landowner, this might be less exciting that the creek's always been here for the last 30 years, right? Shoot, now the creek's over here. Um, so that again speaks to some of the conflicts, but uh, really exciting to see how quickly some of these processes are happening. Uh, we also found uh, more complexity in the depth. So in general, Johnson Creek would usually be like one to two feet deep the whole length. Um, this is right downstream. The, the person taking the picture is standing on the beaver dam here, and I was measuring the depth of this pool with this stick, um, and it was about five feet deep. So as the water, the force of that water is coming over and through that dam, it was scouring out a pool below it. And then that's a great place, again, for fish and other species to use. So again, just creating more variety in the stream instead of sort of the single channel going through. You've got side channels, you've got pools, you've got all sorts of different things going on. Um, and then we only have a little bit of data on it, but we collected a few macroinvertebrate samples, looking at all those bugs that live in the stream. And for one site, uh, we had we always have to do a field duplicate to see how different thing things are. Um, and we decided, well, let's take all of our subsamples for our, our main site in the riffles without beaver dams, and let's take all of our subsamples for our duplicate in the riffles right below beaver dam, so in this riffle right here, and let's see if we see any differences. And so they're right in the same stretch of, of creek, but just those two different types of locations. And we were finding it wasn't a huge difference in terms of our benthic index of biotic integrity, but it was a little higher downstream of the beaver dams. And noticeably, it had a greater diversity of invertebrates, fewer snails, which snails are tend to be associated with poor quality streams, had more mayflies and caddisflies. So that was really exciting. Um, we were really encouraged by this, and so the next year we were planning to do this in more streams and expand this study. Um, and we couldn't do the follow-up study because when we went to do it, every single riffle had a beaver dam on it. 
<laughs> which was a really cool problem to have. So um, the beavers are moving in really quickly. Now that they're here, there's basically dam. It, it's a dam and a pond right until the next dam forms. So um, already just in 10 years, um, it sort of turned into a beaver system. Um, and if anyone's interested in this stuff, um, I really recommend there's a book here called the Beaver Restoration Guidebook. It's focused on Western states, but has a lot of really good information in it uh, throughout the area. Um, and this was a figure from it that I find really useful that I think about a lot. So if you think of an inside, imagine these dams aren't here first, actually. If you just think of a degraded, incised, single channel here, um, and then the beaver dams start to come in, they start to pond water, and then they breach. And over time, then you start to get some channels, some meandering, some bars, some grass bars. Those breach through times, you have side channels. And over a long enough period of time, this whole thing has turned into this beaver wetland complex, right? This is extremely different than this. And this is what we've been used to for the last hundred years or more, but this is what was here for tens of thousands of years, right? And so uh, what we were really excited about, you know, this was like my dream that maybe, you know, by the time I die, there might start to be some of this as the beavers come back. Um, but we were really surprised to find a beaver dam had been placed for three to five years, and we were already seeing this. We were even seeing some of this, side channels, grass bars. Um, so some of these changes can happen really quickly if the beavers are allowed to be there. Um, so some of the thoughts about restoration in general and encouraging stream complexity is to allow space. So this is something that um, is really apparent um, in our in our new developments. We have new standards for riparian buffers where the city now requires 300 feet on either side of a stream where there can't be any roads or houses or anything. So that's what this is here. This is one of this is a a stream right here in Gresham and some of the new developments and that's as close as they're allowed to be, right? So when this beaver dam comes in now, we're not worried about what if it creates something like this eventually, we have room for that, right? Whereas with past development, if the house is right here, you'd have to do something about this or your house is gonna get flooded, right? So that space is by far the most important. Um, I'll talk a little about, about, about tree caging, but yes, beavers will take down a lot of trees. They'll take down all the trees sometimes. So if you don't want them to take down certain trees, you can put a cage around that tree and I'll show how to do that. Uh, plant things that they like to eat, willows, alders, and cottonwoods. Um, and then importantly, perhaps, plant, plant some stuff they don't like to eat, because the beavers may come in and eat and cut down every single stem that you've put into a restoration project, and then you don't have any shade, you don't have any plants for the pollinators. So in this area, that's things like nine bark, conifers, and hawthorn. Um, and just to talk about the conflicts a little bit and how important that space is, here's Johnson Creek as it flows through the middle of downtown Gresham. And then I've overlaid on here um, some of our public utilities. So here's a road, for example. Um, this stream goes under this very small bridge right here. And it can't go through the bridge over here or over here because there's other roads and banks. This is where it has to go, right? So uh, naturally, this stream would like to meander over time throughout this entire floodplain. And it can't because it's got to go under the road here, right? So bigger bridges would be better. We have that constraint in most urban areas. And then this brown line on here is our um, sanitary sewer main. Often sanitary sewer mains are laying right along the sides of creeks because it's the lowest area, the water drains there. Um, it's a relatively direct place to put water uh, or to put a pipe full of water and poop. Um, and that's all well and good when they laid it. And this is exactly where the stream was at that moment. But now it's kind of important that the stream stays right here. If it meanders over here and over there, your wastewater pipe's got to wash out, and that's a problem. Of course, also, there are all these houses. If this stream were to meander throughout its entire floodplain, it would take out hundreds of houses on its way, right? So again, that's why it's so important. Our new standards are a 300-foot buffer around the stream so that it can meander. We don't have any wastewater pipes in there. We don't have any roads. We don't have any houses so that the beavers can do their thing. Um, specifically some of the, uh, here's some pictures of some of the um, conflicts that we've seen. Here's where they dammed up that uh, flow control structure in our constructed wetland. Um, this dam is immediately upstream of a tiny little culvert that goes under a huge road. We actually had uh, a five lane road washout when a beaver chewed tree came and got stuck up against the undersized culvert and the water backed up and washed out our five lane road, costing millions of dollars, tons of hassle. Um, and so what's the real problem here? Some people would say 
it's the beavers because they cut down the tree. Um, other people would say it was that undersized culvert. If you had a huge, broad um, area for the stream to be able to fit through, then it wouldn't matter if the stream moves or there's a dam or a tree comes through, it can pass that. So when that uh, culvert was rebuilt, instead of being 12 feet in diameter, it's now a 40 foot arch culvert that has a lot more room for the stream. Uh, here's a, a manhole that some beavers built a den in. So it, they love to enter underwater and they had dammed up right the stream right downstream of this outfall so that the entrance to this pipe was underwater and they had this safe little area to live and, and lay their kits in, in the manhole. This gets seen quite a lot actually, which is a problem. Um, and here's some that are just in the infrastructure in general. Um, damming up various aspects of it. So these are all things that our operations crew are not super excited about, um, but luckily uh, we found a way to get around all of these conflicts. Um, and that's, we hired um, an expert um, to help us build some coexistent structures. Um, in Oregon, there's a company called Beaver State Wildlife Solutions. Um, in pretty much every state, there are people who do this. I would recommend checking out an organization called the Beaver Institute. Um, they list out sort of certified or recommended contractors who can do this stuff. Um, don't try to do it yourself. When This is what happens when you try to do it yourself often. <laughs> Maybe tree, tree caging you can, but you think you put a cage around the tree and the beavers come, right? You need a specific type of wire, specific type of height and distance from it. And especially building some of the other structures, it's much more complicated. Um, I wanted to throw out, this is something that we were piloting here, um, a completely biodegradable tree protection where we plant a willow stake here. And if if we don't put any protection and plant willow stakes, the beavers will often come and chew down every one. And sometimes they'll re-sprout and sometimes they won't, depending on how big of a stem we put in there. But if we cage the initial stem and then as it sprouts out, the beavers eat those, it's like they keep snacking on all the little edges and the main stem keeps growing. And then this thing uh, decomposes at the end which is cool. Um, this is some of the more fancy stuff that our contractor builds. This is called a culvert protector with a pond leveler. So here's our tiny little undersized culvert here. This pipe, and this is where the beaver dam was. So now when they rebuild, they'll build around this pipe and this cage where the inlet comes from will be under the pond. So then this, uh, they can't dam the culvert itself and the pond can't ever get too deep to wash out the road. Um, but again, we tried to do this ourselves and we're like, ah, the beavers are too smart. They figured it out this stuff doesn't work. But then when we hired someone who knew what they're doing, now it's great and it's been in for many years and is doing its job perfectly. Here's a culvert protector where the beavers are damming up that slot at our sedimentation forebay. They build this special trapezoidal shaped fence. The beaver can get out and around it. It can dam these edges here, but it can't actually block it off. Um, and a quote from our... Um, Stormwater maintenance operations lead said of this specific um, installation, these things are worth their weight in gold, right? This is one that he came out to every single week, had to put his waders on, get all muddy, pull out this mud and grass and be back there the next day. Um, and now he hasn't had to be out there in three years. This thing keeps the beavers out. They're happy. He's happy. Everyone's happy. Uh, so overall, what we're learning in Gresham about beavers is that urban, urban beaver populations are increasing, and we've heard that throughout the country. I've been to some talks like this throughout the country, and that's been true. And not just urban, rural pop populations are as well. Uh, we're finding that beaver dams can help clean stormwater, help remove many of those pollutants and transform them. They can help maintain stream temperatures and even provide a lot of variation in temperature and help to cool certain areas. And they can create stream complexity really quickly within just a few years of coming there and help reverse some of the damage that's been done by all the straightening and um, flash flooding of the areas with urban uh, stormwater. Um, but of course, the beaver activity can create a lot of conflicts with the infrastructure. Um, but coexistent structures uh, can be really helpful if you have a professional building them. And so in general, what we're finding is that beavers can help reverse problems caused by urban stormwater for those who are willing to take up the challenge to work alongside them. And so it's still, you know, it's still a bit of a mindset to make sure that you're okay with change. There are some people who want to still just go in and trap them all out and take down all the dams. Um, but if you're willing to invest a little bit of time and energy and um, adaptability, uh, it can be really beneficial for all involved. And I think we have time for some questions. 
Well, this is this is wonderful. There's some good questions, but Mark has his hand up, so let's Mark. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, I want I want to share what all of us in this field used to do 50 years ago. We looked at good sediment versus bad sediment. Okay. Al Al did the research. It's the particle size distribution, and the natural sediment has a. It's almost all small particles. And that helps the the all the critters, macroinvertebrates, and so forth. And so I recommend you do look around and actually analyze the sediment and see if it meets the guidance for what's called natural good sediment and versus bad sediment. And Excellent. thank you. That's a that's a good suggestion. You know, Coco Red L, you can look up that online, I think. Okay. Our first question was. <clears throat> Were the beavers already there or did you introduce them? Yeah, excellent question. We did not introduce any of them. So they're in the surrounding area and then they're moving in. And I think what changed is that uh, fewer people were trapping them out. Uh, more land was bought up as public land. And so we weren't trapping them out there and more restoration was happening so that they actually had something to eat if they came in. Uh, but they all came in on their own. So there are a few places I've heard where beaver reintroductions can be useful and like really remote alpine areas, for example, or if there isn't one for, if there isn't a beaver population for hundreds of miles, but beavers are actually really good at dispersing and they'll often move into suitable area um, if, if you allow them there and plant some food for them. Yeah. Yeah, that was my question because we had a speaker uh that was a, a father and his adult son and they had this little program that got funded by the state in washington and the beavers would go to another home they just wouldn't stay where they were relocated but in right. washington in seattle actually there's a, a good park there that uh, goes into our salt water and <clears throat> apparently the, the, the beavers have built a dam in the creek there but the water level is so low that the salmon can't, they can't breach the beaver dam. And so they're waiting for, um, they're hoping that the water will be, um, you know, high enough now um, and that the, the stream is not in its natural state. So it has a lot of concrete around it, if I understand it, so that this, you know, so the beaver dam is hard for the, the salmon to breach right now. Yes. And I have heard that, uh, be a problem in some areas. And I've definitely seen seen some dams that would be really hard for a salmon to breach. Um, and in general, what I've heard from salmon biologists when I've asked that is, yes, it can be a problem sometimes. And the salmon co-evolved with these beavers for a really long time. And in general, the beaver dams provide more benefit than, um, than blockage, uh, but it can be a problem, especially in a in a degraded system where maybe there aren't those side channels yet for them to get around. Exactly. Yep. Gloria asked, "Our beaver dams are covered with vegetation. Does the vegetation add to or subtract from the water cleaning um, effectiveness?" Yeah, it add to it generally. So, especially roots of vegetation. Um, have a lot of microbes associated with them that can that can help with water quality and um, yeah in general that and then even when the water flows over it then it's filtering through the vegetation as well so yeah we get excited when our dams have been around long enough that there's vegetation on top and that can help it even more. Well, Jeff commented that it <clears throat> removes phosphorus. I suppose that's because plants. Uh, need the phosphorus to uh, grow and build protein. So it, it makes sense that it, uh, it's a good way to get yeah. rid of phosphorus. And that, that's our guess, but we don't, yeah, all I have is the, is the, the data that, that it removes it. So I don't know what the exact mechanism is for that, but most likely it's the plant growth. Okay, what animals are natural predators of beavers? Yeah, my understanding is that, um, it's mostly, and maybe someone else on this call might know more about it. I understand it's mostly like wolves and mountain lions. Um, and so that's actually a conversation we've been having recently where most of their natural predators are gone from the area. Um, maybe a coyote could take one out at some point um, under certain circumstances. But if beaver populations get really big at some point and they don't really have those natural predators anymore would it make sense to actually exert some predation power or pressure on them from the human community 
So that that's an excellent question. What happens when a hundred year storm washes the beaver dam away and spreads the pollutants down the river? Yeah, exactly. So yeah, if you're thinking about the pollutants sitting there um, in in the sediment and then it gets washed out, they go down the river. Um, so yes, that can definitely happen. A couple of things that I have learned about it is that a lot of the pollutants, by the time they're in the accumulated sediment, have either bound, especially like metals, they're no longer in their dissolved form, they're bound to the sediment and not bioavailable to the organisms in the same way. And so it tends to it tends to be less polluted than it was before it had settled in that way. And a lot of the pesticides have changed form with the microbes. Um, a lot of the nutrients have been taken up. So there, there's generally less pollution in it than there was before. Um, and as when when a lot of that's flushing through in the hundred year storm, in general, in stormwater science, we think of, um, you know, when those really big floods are happening, it's kind of like, okay, all bets are off and most of the organisms are just trying to like get through that storm, right? Um, but it's less of a chronic problem. It's a very acute problem where like all this stuff is happening, the flow, the sediment, the pollutants all happening in this moment. But then a few days later, it's gone back to normal. Whereas in general, what we work to remove is pollutants during what we call the water quality storm, which is a frequent storm that maybe happens 20 or 40 times a year, um, where those low level pollutants are causing a chronic um, exposure. And that's harder for a lot of organisms to deal with. So these dams can help to remove sort of that more chronic, lower level water quality storm pollution, help reduce it a bit. And then maybe in those big storms, it, it does go down and cause exposure. Do you know about substituting beaver dams for man-made dams for pasture bonds in rural areas? I don't know much about it, but I have heard um, there's definitely folks I know in Eastern Oregon and some in Washington who have worked on um, so, yeah, turning um, you know an irrigation pond or something that uh, a person's typically built with concrete and taking that out and putting in what's called a beaver dam analog, which is usually made with like some vertical sticks pounded into the ground and then weaving um, some willows or some other flexible wood throughout it and creating sort of this matrix. And then it itself sort of acts like a beaver dam and or beavers will actually come and build on that. Um, and I know there's a lot going on with that. I haven't been involved in it, but I've heard in general that it's been pretty successful. We had one presentation that sort of showed that the beavers took over. Oh, good. Excellent. <laughs> okay. Um, I, this was wonderful. I really enjoyed it, Katie, because I live in Portland and I do some work on Johnson Creek down.